And our guest this week is Jim Tracy, a journalist who has followed the Robert Garrow case for decades. He has written a book about Garrow and his murder spree and also wrote an in-depth series of articles for the Postar newspaper in Glens Falls. Jim, welcome. We Thank appreciate you. you being here. Nice to be here. So you were just a boy when you first heard about Robert Garrow in the, in the summer of 73. Yeah, so I, I was eight years old, but I knew the area that they were looking for him because my father had a hunting camp in Speculator, north of Speculator, between Speculator and Indian Lake. And uh, I'd been up there quite a bit, following him around with my BB gun. Eventually, we got a call one night from the uh, Bureau of Criminal Investigation Unit of the New York State Police saying that uh, he broke into our camp. So as an eight-year-old boy, I saw how he had broken into the camp. He had taken a white card table, placed it in front of the door because he didn't want to break. It was padlocked from the outside, and he slid through the transom above the door. And the, when he was eventually caught three days later, uh, he had the clothes, clothes on from the camp. Uh, green Allegan Michigan sweatshirt, a Mickey Mouse t-shirt, and a pair of plum-colored pants, and, uh, which are still in the possession of uh, Hamilton County. Um, they have them in a cardboard box down Really, there, to this day? To this day, along with his rifle um, at the Hamilton County Jail. So that had to be scary as an eight-year-old boy to see that boot print there yes, and know yeah, who that belonged yeah, to. Yeah, because it was huge. You know, you had the feeling he was still there. Um, obviously, my father knew he wasn't, he, he, you know, but uh, yeah, it was very scary, very scary. The whole two weeks was, was frightening. When he, he left our camp, he walked up the road to uh, Deerfield Lodge Christian Camp, and that's where he stole a car. And that was the car that took him from Speculator to uh, Mineville. That's when he blew through one of the roadblocks, right, with yes. that car? Yes. He jumps the roadblock, and two troopers pursuing a car up 30 north headed to Blue Mountain Lake, and they're right on his tail when uh, the police car blows a fan belt and breaks down. So, so they break down, and they don't have uh, radio transmission was sporadic up there because of the mountains, and that hindered the uh, manhunt the entire 12 days. So they had no... Uh, uh, radio so they had to walk it to a the two troopers had to walk to a uh, phone booth so he he eluded the manhunt and relocated to uh, Essex County which is where he grew up and knew the area and I think he he did that because he needed a pair of glasses he lost his glasses when he ran so he went to uh, his sister's house um, in Mineville Witherby and uh, had a visit his sister um, had her call his home and asked for his glasses and she spoke in code. And police suspected that uh, family members were, were helping him, getting him food? Yeah, yeah, because they heard the, uh, they had the phone tapped and they heard the, uh, the code language. Um, you know, she, she, she was very subtle about it. She said, everything's all right in Witherby and uh, please send a pair of glasses. But his wife, who she was speaking to, knew the phone was tapped and she said so. And she also said that, uh, you know, I'm not sending the glasses. This has gotten to be too much of a mess. And that's when police caught a break. They caught his, uh, his uh, nephew bringing him food. A trooper named Ransom Kaola stopped him and uh, questioned him. And he admitted what he was doing. Um, and that's when, uh, that was Thursday, August 9th, and they closed in. And, and that day they, they shot him and uh, captured him. Forest Ranger shot him, right? Yep, a forest ranger named Hillary LeBlanc, who was uh, 25 years old and new on the job, and um, Garrow wouldn't drop the rifle, so he fired. I don't think the state police were too happy that LeBlanc shot him, but but he was alive, so. Uh, and that's important because they wanted him alive. Because they wanted him alive, so it was lucky he was alive, so it worked out. There were still missing victims at that point. Yes, yes, a lot of them. And, and they needed this, and especially they were concerned with the Pets girl, Susan Pets, who was the, the girl who was still missing. Her boyfriend was found in Johnsburg, Weavertown, dead. They would have been victims two and three uh, at, from, and, that, and from that summer From rampage. that spree, from that yeah. spree, yeah. Based on your research and reporting over the years, how many murders do they think he may be responsible for, may have committed? Uh, in the 20s. Henry McCabe, the lead detective, he told me, um, that he suspected that. Mm. And he said, we, he was eventually convicted of four. He died convicted of four. And, and Henry felt sure it was in the 20s. But in all these years, since his conviction, his imprisonment, his death, 
none has ever been solved. None has never been directly linked to Robert Garrow. Have there ever been investigations over the decades to reopen those cold cases? There is now cold case agents assigned to these cases. Um, but when you talk to them, they seem somewhat ambivalent because they're so old. Um, the, probably the most, the biggest investigation was the one in Hamilton, Ontario that I, that, that, that I had told them about. Uh, a journalist got a hold of me and, and we did a story and it, that got the ball rolling up there, but a girl was abducted just with the same MO that Garrow used. Grabbed, dragged into the woods, tied, and uh, she fought and he killed her and took off. And uh, witnesses who saw a man hanging out that night identified him pretty much as Garrow, a stocky guy with glasses. And so are you convinced after your years of research and reporting that, that it was, may have been Garrow who was uh, tied to that, Absolutely to that killing? Absolutely convinced. But this, these cases are so old that, that I, you know, a lot of them just don't want to look into it. And so nothing active looking into Garrow to see if he was No, not that I know of at all. Not that I know of at all. You also covered a part of this story that a lot of people may not remember, how Garrow's lawyers were vilified by some and certainly questioned by others about information that he shared with them that they refused to share. Yes, Frank Armini and Frank Belge, two lawyers from Syracuse, New York. Garrow had a relationship with Armani because he had represented him on some smaller issues, a couple civil issues and a couple smaller criminal issues back in Syracuse. And uh, they took his case. These guys are thinking, well, we know he got one murder and possibly maybe he had something to do with the couple from Boston, the boy that was murdered in the same way and the girl that disappeared. So they get him to talk. Well, he um, blows them away with this incredible story, incredible story of many, many more murders. And he also tells them where missing bodies are, um, particularly, he gave them three, but one washed up ashore in Syracuse and Black Creek uh, in the interim. So they never brought that out. But the other two bodies were Susan Petz, the girl from Boston who was, uh, her boyfriend was killed in Weavertown mm. and a 16 year old girl in Syracuse who was assumed a runaway. He told them where he had hid the bodies. They tape recorded it, didn't believe him. They thought he, Garrow was going, trying it for an insanity plea and you know, telling me it was this maniac that killed you know, it was before the term serial killer was coined. That was, term wasn't coined until the 1980s. But um, they called it back then a repeat killer. And they don't believe it. So they start investigating. And they find the bodies. Uh, one was in uh, Mineville near Garrow's boyhood home. And one was behind Garrow's house in Oakwood Cemetery. So <clears throat> they find these bodies. And, and uh, now they're in a pickle because they start researching the law, and Belgi told Armani that there's no way we can tell on our own client. Under the Fifth Amendment, Sixth Amendment, Fourteenth Amendment, um, the right to self-incrimination, they could not tell authorities or the victim's parents about these bodies without Garrow's permission, and he wasn't about to get the permission. There was no way they could tell because the body's locations alone would implicate their client. And, and this tore the two attorneys apart. They finally come up with a way to reveal the information, legally, morally, and ethically. They'll meet with the prosecutor and trade the location of the bodies, the hidden bodies, for a lighter sentence on Garrow in a plea bargain. They'll put the, they'll put the onus on the state. Mm -hmm. Well, the state told them they're nuts. And the state told them, you know, we'll prosecute you. If, you, if you're obstructing justice. They didn't give them all the information, but they said they could solve several crimes for, in exchange for a lighter sentence. They implied it without explicitly saying it. So the uh, um, state officials refused. So they kept this secret for a year and uh, these families suffered. It's not revealed until the next summer at trial. So nearly a year, um, they kept this information. During the course of testimony, it came out that, that they had found the bodies. At the trial that followed yes. the summer. So this came out at trial. Uh, the evidence, the testimony came out. But the missing girls' bodies had already been found in the months between when Garrow confessed this and when he actually went to trial. So, so the girls had been found. Yes. Uh, passersby found 
the uh, body of uh, Susan Petz on uh, December 1st, Saturday, December 1st, 1973, two months after, two, almost three months after Belgian Armani had found and photographed the body. And a week later, a Syracuse University student was uh, doing a project on the habitat of squirrels, and he was cutting through the unused portion of Oakwood Cemetery, and he came across the second girl. So, so the girls were found. Um, and then six months later at trial, the lawyers admitted that they had knew that where they had been all along. Which, of course, created the public outrage and the anguish for the yes, families. Yes, and even the legal community turned against them. Eventually, when the dust settled, the court ruled that uh, a client has the right to uh, confide in his attorney without the attorney ratting on him. And uh, that was basically the decision that the attorney can't tell on him. Now, now the, the catch is, if it was a crime that was going to be admit, committed in the future, if Garrett said, I'm going to kill this person next week, they would have to report it. But these were past crimes and nothing could be done. The girls were already dead. And uh, so the court ruled in their favor. And uh, now this has uh, evolved into a major case in every law school in America. They teach this as, as, as a, a moral dilemma. And the colleges believe, most of the professors believe that um, they did the right thing. And uh, they use an example of professional responsibility of a lawyer, a very, very controversial one, but, but it took dry classroom theory of attorney-client privilege and turned it into a compelling case that students were really interested in this. And uh, you know, Armani and Belgi have sort of become uh, legals, uh, heroes in legal circles um, for their vehement defense of a client.